in Intel, we have, or in Intel Darlan specifically, I have about 200 employees with PhD. Slightly over 1,000 employees have a master's degree. Another 700 to 800 have a bachelor's degree. Even my technician, they, quite a number of them have a bachelor's degree. You, you might be asking, Intel Dalian is just a manufacturing site. Man manufacturing site, why do you need all those PhDs, master's degree, you know, highly skilled, highly competent, highly educated, right? And the reason being that if you know fab operations or fab wafer fab uh, fabrication uh, facility, it is one of the most advanced, most sophisticated man manufacturing facility in the world. And a lot of things are happen in the fab. In fact, I would say that our engineers love problems. They are happy when they solve problems. <laughs> They are really happy, and after we solve the problem, we go for some uh, really nice, uh, um, you know, celebrations. So what I like to talk to you today is about model-based problem solving. Um, you know, problems. Sometimes when we solve problems, it, it can be a lot of approach. And let me share with you, and I put myself in front of you to be vulnerable, telling you about bad things about myself. You know, when I go home, normally I put the car keys on the table. Almost every time. But sometimes I misplace it. When I misplace the car keys, what do I do? I look around. Right? I look at the table, no keys. So as I look around, very often I will come back to look at the table again. <laughs> it must be there. I've been doing that for the last several years. It must be that I even touched the surface of the table. Where is the keys? I know this never happened to all of you. Right? So that's the normal human behavior, human reaction in solving a problem. Right? Based on our experience, based on what we know. And this doesn't work in Intel, especially the FAP environment. So why sometimes we are so slow to identify or find the root causes of a problem? I did not say find out the problem. I talk about root causes. I will elaborate a little bit more later on. And based on the study, wrong problem statement, about 18%. And the other key one is to make conclusion without data. Right? That, hey, that must be the problem. All right, let's solve that one. In fact, I'm going to give you one simple example, real life example, and I want to test you later on. Right? The wrong problem statement. In Intel, when we solve a problem, normally we spend a lot of time in a group setting. Sometimes we spend several hours just trying to define the problem. The reason being that if you define the wrong problem, you will be solving the wrong problem and nothing is going to happen. So we're really very serious about that. This is the first step of a problem solving. And during the defining of the problem, we normally go into very detail, look at the data, look at the information. And there are two scenarios. One is that we define a problem, then we look at the data and look at the information to validate whether this is the right problem. Or normally, as a human nature, we define a problem, then we go out to look for data and information to prove that this is the problem. There are two different things, right? Because the second case is that if you go out to look at the data and information to prove that this is the problem, then you will have a bias. Right? Some of the information, okay? no, I don't like this information. It doesn't show that this is a problem. Throw away. Right? Then you have a wrong problem statement. And also making conclusion without data, the right data. Just jump to the conclusion. Hey, my gut feel, my experience, my training, my education says that this must be the problem. Right? And by the way, that sometimes may solve the problem 
without solving the root cause. And that's an example I'm going to share with you. This is a car, very nice car. I'm not sure anyone ever have it or not in the US. Blair may, have, may, may look. <laughs> now, you may have watched the TV series called Man vs. Food, right? And what I want to share with you is an example of a car versus ice cream. It's not any car. This is the car called Pontiac, manufactured by General Motors. This example is a real life example. Right? It's a car versus ice cream, versus multiple flavors of ice cream. So I man managed to get this one in the Chinese. So a long time ago, there was a customer of um, General Motor. He bought a new Pontiac. And, and he encountered some problem with the car. So he sent in a letter to make a complaint. And it was ignored. All right? And then he did not give up because the problem continued to happen. He wrote a second letter again. The problem he encountered was that as part of the family tradition, after dinner, they will pick a flavor of ice cream. And then the person, the father, will drive his car to the store to buy the ice cream and bring it back for dessert. And he just recently bought a car. Right? So he drove a car over there and he bought ice cream every night. But the problem was that every time when he bought vanilla flavor, the car cannot be started. If he bought chocolate, strawberry, no problem. So, okay, let me try again, try again. It always happened that way. For me, what could be the problem? Very obvious, right? Car versus ice cream. Very simple. Let me reiterate the problem again. Vanilla, ice cream, car cannot start. Strawberry, chocolate, or other flavor, no problem. So what is the problem? Ice cream. Ice cream. Very good. All right? You know, having so much of a Harry Potter and a lot of the rings, I believe in supernatural. <laughs> Things happen. All right? Vanilla ice cream could very well be radioactive, you know, it may be cursed. If we buy the ice cream, car cannot start. So, very simple problem, right? How to solve it? Don't buy the vanilla ice cream. <laughs> problem solved, everybody happy. Seriously, this can be solved, right? You just don't buy that, right? So next time, no more, that one, everything good. Very, very simple. But if you throw this problem to an engineer, they will not like it. Because engineers, or especially engineers in Intel, is trained to, when we solve a problem, after we solve the problem, we still want to understand why we have solved the problem. Okay? So let me give you a little bit more information on this one. So this is a process that we use called MBPS. By the way, this process, we do have a training class in Intel. It is two to four hours for the basic class. For the advanced class, it's a nine hours. And I'm going to teach you in 10 to 50 minutes. So the process we have, first of all, is to define the right problem and define problem right. And we, when you look at that, you really have to think at the, look at the problem in a multiple angles. And, and the problem is not that car cannot be started. Yeah, it's, it's correct. But you have to define very accurately. Car cannot be started when vanilla ice cream is bought, right, and at this store. So that you have a very clear definition of the problem that can lead you to the right path when you try to solve the problem. And after that, it is not that uh, sitting down and thinking about, wow, this could be the solution, or this 
problem can be resolved by not eating the vanilla ice cream, which is true. For us, we have to develop the model, and that requires creativity, imaginations, very high degree of technical skill, and a little bit of a craziness. Right? And later on, I will share with you some of the problems that have resolved in Intel. You will look at it and say, wow, really? And, and the solution is actually it's very simple. Okay? So that's what we do. Define the right problem, define the problem right, and develop a model step by step. Right? Looking at the own angle from a different dimensions, you know, throw away your biases, throw away your, your perception. And normally what we do is that the first one, you'll take a several hours. The second one sometimes takes several days just to have a group of people debating with each other, define all those uh, informations. So car versus ice cream, the model development. Right? We, we will look at the new Pontiac car. Right? It is not an old car. We have to define very accurately. Car engine cannot start. Other parts of the car have no problem. Radio, no problem. The power window, well, I don't think they had a power window at that time. But it's okay. The, power, the window was working fine. The location of the ice cream store. Right? They even did the so, uh, experience on, if you go to other store, same company, the, you know, same company, buy vanilla ice cream at a different store. It was okay. And when buying vanilla flavor ice cream only when it has this problem. So what could be the problem? Again, go back to vanilla ice cream, right? That is a problem. So to cut the story short, what they have found was that because vanilla flavor is very popular, so in the store, they place it at the entrance of the store. The other flavors were put at the back of the store. So for the customer, when they come in to buy vanilla ice cream, they can get the ice cream very fast and go back to the car. The problem with the car is that it's a new car. They have a new technology. And if the time is too short, when they stop the car and restart it again, if the time is too short, the engine cannot cool down fast enough and they have this called vapor lock mechanism that cannot be started. It has to be for a, after a period of time. If you buy different flavor, it takes longer time, which means that there's an interval is longer. Then the engine cool down, it can start the car. So eventually, GM has to re redesign the vapor lock mechanism to, to solve this problem. Right? But to many people, wow, well, very simple, don't buy vanilla ice cream, I, that one might be very, very difficult, right? Now, let me share with you other problems we have solved in Intel. This one is not from Intel, but I can give you other, other you know, information about other problems. I still remember when I was in the Albuquerque, in, inside the fab, when I went inside the fab, there, is, there was one door. It's a door, automatic door. They always lock it inside the fab, always. So I'm curious, I said, wow, well, there are so many hundreds of doors, why this door always locked? People have to use it. People have to go to use another door, take a longer route and go inside the, inside the room. So what was told to me was that there was one metrology tool that is located next to the door. And the metrology tool intermittently was giving a problem, cannot measure accurately, intermittently. So after a lot of analysis, model-based problem solving, so on and so forth, they finally found out that when the door is open, the pressure in the room drop. Because in a fab environment, certain room, we have a positive pressure, higher pressure as compared to outside, so that the particles cannot go inside. So when they open the door, the pressure drop, and they cause the airflow. When they cause the airflow, it causes the measurement, measuring it problem. Right? And the other example, 
I was has hesitating whether to tell you or not um, because it's pretty funny. So I try not to share too uh, clear the information, right? So that was a one organization, not in China. In the assembly area, they have multiple similar tools. One of the two, one of the equipment, always having a problem. The yield of the equipment is always a problem. And the engineer has done everything, including fingerprinting. Fingerprinting means that they will compare this particular tool with all other tools in terms of um, the speed of a conveyor belt, in terms of um, temperature profile, ups and downs, talking about the materials, using the same materials and everything. For six months, they could not solve the problem. You know what they did? They brought in a priest to the line to do something. Right? Why I knew about that? Because the person who made the arrangement wrote it down in his uh, weekly report and circulated. They said, hey, I've brought in the priest already, have a spray some of the holy water. This one should perform better in the future. Unfortunately, it did not work. Right? So eventually, we brought in someone from a state in a fab environment. He came in, he looked at things. Within a week, he solved the problem. The reason he solved the, the, the problem actually was uh, pretty tricky. It is because of the exhaust pipe. The angle of the exhaust pipe was slightly different from other tools. Because of that, it caused the air turbulence inside and it caused the issue inside the chamber. Right? Now, why that person can solve the problem so fast while many other engineers in the organization could not? The main reason was that this problem never, never happened in assembly organization. They never thought that airflow could cause a problem because they already have a limited, they already been biased already that, hey, this is the experience that we have. This is what happened before. This will happen again. Versus someone from a fab, they have an open-minded, they look at things totally differently and then they are able to figure out that, uh, what could be the problem and do the experiment. When you look at the problems, right, you have to make sure you define it very, very well. And when you try to solve the problem, you have to come out with the models step by step and have a totally different thinking, different perception. Whatever experience may serve you well, but your experience that you have may actually prevent you from moving forward because that is the bias that you will have. All right? All right. Thank you very much.